Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I'm the president-elect of the European Society, and it's my pleasure to go more into the personal experience of alarms in the ICU. So these are my disclosures, and I would like to thank Mindry and for, for making this symposium happen, because we are dealing with a daily experience we know, and that's obvious, uh, that it would be very difficult to have critically ill patients uh, with no monitoring. We know that uh, we need to assess treatment response, but we need also to really be very careful at the physiological monitoring because we can detect uh, early organ dysfunction. We can also restore when we have treated the patients, uh, and we can also guide uh, uh, the, the, the following uh, management. On one hand, if we were disconnecting patients from any monitoring, which some case, in some cases may happen for patients who are very isolated because of any infectious disease, and this paper came out before the COVID-19 experience, uh, and they just measured in the ICU the difference of outcomes between patients who were isolated for any respiratory or multidrug resistant bacteria uh, reason, and those patients were compared to other patients. Um, the, the, the very interesting thing is to measure the impact of isolation in terms of safety. When a patient is locked in a room with a very limited number of nurses and doctors coming in to check, to evaluate, to provide a clinical examination, is it so safe uh, and are there any, any uh, uh, side effects uh, for that? And uh, the interesting thing is that after adjusting for confounders, there were an increased number of uh, uh, undesirable side effects uh, and uh, medical errors that happened in those patients who were isolated. The safety of making a patient isolated in the ICU is now very clearly mentioned. So we need to find a balance between keeping the patients in the safe way and another problem that is the alarm fatigue. Alarms are producing a certain number of burden for everyone in the ICU, for patients, for family members, and for healthcare providers. This concept of alarm fatigue uh, is really a cacophony of sounds, and you know all of them. If you close your eyes, you can repeat on your mind every pump, every ventilator, every monitor alarm, every renal replacement therapy, or anything that would provide a noise, uh, and this noise creates an alarm fatigue. It's not something that is uh, uh, burdening at the time it is making noise, it is something that is burdening over time and it adds to many other sources of burden, creating discomfort for patients, creating harm for family members and creating a large burden for healthcare providers. The other problem, and we are getting to the other extreme of uh, uh, this uh, alarm fatigue is that uh, you have so much alarm that you alarms that you are missing the right one and inside everything the alarm that is going to uh, uh, make uh, uh, something that you uh, alert you that something is happening is going to be missed in all other alarms um, let's look at the level of noise and as you know zero is the level the threshold for audition for normal people and the central air conditioning is 50 decibels. So you can see that a telephone ring is 70, that a ventilator alarm is 70, that a staff conversation at the bedside is 72, that a monitor alarm is 78, uh, and then you can see that a nebulizer is 80, perfusor alarm is 81, and a nursing station is 84 we live in a very noisy environment and this has its own toxicity. It affects everyone in the ICU, patients, healthcare providers and family members, but it's also something that makes that uh, nurses, for example, are going to have so much burden that it can ca create moral distress, burnout, and the intent to leave the ICU. 
Let's look at uh, comparative uh, uh, noise data with, uh, again, decibels. Um, and you can see that zero is, again, the threshold for human hearing. Um, a quiet forest is 20, a whisper is 30, an average conversation, not the one we have now, is 50. But then you can see that uh, uh, there are sources of noises of noise that are uncontrollable in the ICU and are sometimes mandatory, but still create some burden. So there are many data, including information that goes to the lay public, making that this noise in the ICU has a toxicity that we can call alarm fatigue. So this is where we are. We are into a system where too many alarms not only cause burden, but also make you missing the, the important one, and too little monitoring affects patient safety. So where is the balance, uh, and how can we assess uh, the uh, global vision on, uh, on all of this? Uh, so for the patients, uh, there are many studies, qualitative ones, providing worry, annoyance, uh, and concerns about care quality from the alarms when you know, sometimes there is a very simple alarm uh, based on something that is expected, uh, and the nurse knows that she has to go to the other room, where for us in Europe, we have often not one nurse to one patient. So we, we then have an alarm that is going to maintain. So people in the room, patients and family members mostly, are concerned about uh, the quality of care when no one comes to control the alarm. For family members, it's a source of worry of delirium of family members that is very much undermined, of stress, of sleep deprivation, because when they are at home, they still listen and hear the alarms, and questions about safety. All of this noise is created by the ICU, the number of alarm devices, the non-actionable alarms uh, at many places in the ICU, the volumes that could be controlled, um, and even for the nurses, it creates stress. Uh, it is decreasing sensitivity. You have so much alarm that when there is one that is very important, you're going to miss it. Dissatisfaction and also safety. I'm mostly referring on psychological safety. There are a lot of studies that have not only assessed the noise toxicity in the ICU, but also made some correlation with uh, uh, individual outcomes at a patient, a nurse, or a family uh, level. So this is a, a very funny study where the number, and there, the, the, this study published in PLUS One has been very much communicated because they have taken all monitor data for a certain number of patients, measuring um, arrhythmia for more than 12,000 patients, uh, and calculating all of this in a one-month period. So then you end up with about 400,000 audible alarms, uh, which is 100, 187 per bed and per day. So when you get to this and you want to understand alarm fatigue, uh, you can also understand that almost 90% of these alarms are false alarms, alarms that should not be there, alarms that we could control or maybe assess or maybe adjust or maybe only make that they are not there anymore. And this creates uh, a lot uh, of uh, uh, um, false information. Uh, we know that 93% uh, of the true TVs uh, were not sustained long enough to run treatment. Uh, and so we have plenty of noise, uh, and these excessive alarms create uh, the alarm fatigue. We know that not only we could control them by making appropriate settings, uh, we know that there are plenty of uh, rhythms that should not be uh, uh, an information, that there are non-actionable events, um, that some sometimes it's about the amplitude of the complexes, of the curious complexes that could be uh, made, uh, or sometimes uh, BB blocks making that we should be uh, aware of that and we should uh, adjust uh, the monitor according to that, and sometimes it's about uh, a VP rhythm. So this alarm fatigue is really a source of burden, making that uh, when we go to qualitative interviews, mostly to the staff, uh, we can see that it has a real burden in terms of fatigue, of moral distress, of burnout, uh, and it's one of the reasons sometimes people are so tired that are starting to think on another way to live their life and leave the ICU. Overall, 
we know that uh, this alarm desensitization, making that we are giving little attention overall to alarms, missing some of the important information, makes that uh, we are also harming uh, sometimes and reducing patient safety. There are competing priorities in an ICU for many nurses. There are no escalation plan. When an alarm is there, we need to have a certain action. Sometimes the ICU is so big that we cannot get to the alarm. Sometimes we don't know exactly what is the alarm and one is under the other one. And sometimes in, in a given ICU, the responsibility for alarm in, are not so clear. We know also that the actionable limits have to be uh, uh, fought at a unit level. And uh, we note also that many alarms are duplicated. So all of this makes that we are reducing patient safety by creating alarm fatigue and alarm desensitization. This is a systematic review on the impact of alarm fatigue. And again, the burden of alarm has been really put forward in this study. And the burden is always seen by the nurses as something that is not justified and is just adding to other sources of burden in the ICU. Interestingly, you can really have a measurement of that. You can assess how much you can rank the priorities and you can rank the toxicity of these alarms. And there are many papers that are coming up to show how much we need to have an action on that. So I'm not getting into any solution. I'm just providing the, the evidence that the toxicity of alarm for everyone at stake in an ICU makes that uh, these data are reproduced and reproduced. Uh, and until recently with the COVID-19 experience, uh, we had so much on that uh, that uh, people need to find a solution. One of the solution would be to apply artificial, uh, artifi art artificial intelligence into that. And there are many programs that are now active, uh, some of them being pilots, some of them being already elaborated and validated, and some of them being used on a daily basis at some places. There are very little evidence that this translates into improvement at a patient, family, or healthcare provider level, because we are at the start of this, uh, but we know that there are ways uh, to really reduce alarm fatigue and reduce the toxicity of alarms, and we look forward to a literature that would then assess uh, the impact on this on people outcome in the, in the, people's outcome in the ICU. So to sum up, the physiological response to critical illness is strongly linked to outcome. So we need to monitor and to have an early detection of treatment response. We know that alarm fatigue really add to uh, reduce safety uh, in the ICU and we can't accept that. We also know that alarm fatigue affects patients, family members, healthcare workers. It is real. There is a lot of evidence either from a quantitative or qualitative analysis, uh, and we have identified the, the consequences of that. Uh, now we are at a starting period where solutions start to appear, and we look forward to proper evaluation of these solutions on all the burden that I have been describing during my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.